This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. Since the pandemic began, Connecticut has nearly 33,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases. Deaths are up, but hospitalizations continue to trend downward. Is Connecticut ready to reopen? Today, where we live, Governor Ned Lamont calls in to answer our questions and yours. We've got him on the line until 925. Here's the number to call, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Again, Governor Ned Lamont calling in today on the show. Governor Lamont, welcome back. Hi, Lucy. Good morning. Uh, let's just launch right into it with reopening, uh, again, uh, staggered reopening starting next week. Your administration has said there are seven criteria that the state needs to reach to decide whether it's safe to begin reopening the state. Where are we today, Governor? Uh, much better than we were two weeks ago, and we still have a way to go. Uh, as you pointed out, um, hospitalizations and hospital capacity was very important just to make sure we had uh, some capacity if there were some flare-ups. And I think right now um, we're in good shape there. We say 40 percent capacity. Uh, We said we needed more PPE, particularly particularly the masks, uh, different types, surgical masks, N95 masks. That we're loading up on um, as supply and demand slowly get into balance. You know, we've struggled over the last uh, month or so, just in time inventory to keep people going there. I know you've got Dr. Lee coming on later and the importance of testing. And we've ramped up our testing um, a lot in the last couple of weeks. We have to ramp it up a lot in the next couple of weeks as well so that we're able to test, to A, the frontline workers, B, the most vulnerable populations, and then more asymptomatic testing so we can get a sense of what's going on more broadly in the community. And finally, testing is the most worthwhile if it's test and trace track and trace. So once we find somebody uh, is infected, we find out who that person has been in contact with over the previous, say, week or so, and we can contact them and either get them tested or have them self-quarantine. Those are the key metrics as we uh, get towards uh, May 20th. And even then, Lucy, May 20th is just a baby step, right? Um, uh, Some outdoor dining with, uh, you know, significant social distancing in place, retail stores, um, as long as you have um, uh, significant, um, you know, uh, spacing there, everybody wearing a mask. We're going to be very careful as we uh, edge our way back to uh, a new normal. I want to get into more about the testing and tracing, Governor, but just something that you said about uh, certain stores uh, being open as long as people wear masks. People who are going out grocery shopping now, uh, not everybody is heeding uh, what you in your executive order said was masks need to be worn, uh, began practice social distancing. So what happens May 20th or later when you see people who are still not paying attention or don't want to follow this rule of wearing a mask? Well, if you're in a store and in an enclosed area, you must wear a mask, be you an employee or be you a customer. And uh, that, that's what the rule is. I would say, Lucy, that 90-plus um, percent of this has been self-enforced. And as you look around the country at, at places that maybe have reopened a few weeks in front of us, um, people are loath to go into stores, especially those that um, are not practicing um, the mask and the social distancing. And if you don't feel comfortable going up to uh, somebody, maybe your neighbor, and say, I think uh, you should be following the protocols, then give us a call on 211. We'll get somebody there just to uh, give a friendly reminder to the uh, proprietors. You can join our conversation with Governor Ned Lamont, 888-720-WMPR, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Gene's calling in from Coventry. Gene, what's your quick comment or question? Hi, good morning. Um, Thanks for taking my call. Um, Yeah, so about the face mask issue, um, I was driving through Hartford last week, and I saw a police altercation with an individual, several squad cars, several members of the public, and none of the Hartford police were wearing any face protection. And then yesterday, my husband got into a little fender bender in Bloomfield. Um, Nobody was injured, or it was pretty minor, but there were several police cars, a couple of uh, fire engines and uh, ambulance. And my husband said, besides him and the other driver, no one 
was wearing face protection. So mm. why aren't our first responders wearing face masks? Thank you for uh, uh, your call, Jim. Wearing, uh, Jean, Go ahead, thank Devin. you for that call. Uh, they should be wearing um, the face mask. I will um, you know, talk to James Ravella about that, get that um, guidance out there uh, uh, loud and clear. Every municipality probably um, has different uh, customs, but we're going to be very clear that this is, uh, this is the executive order. Mm-hmm. One thing about the fender bender, which you might find uh, of, of interest, is that um, while we have 40% less traffic than we did pre-COVID, uh, we also have um, 40% more car-related fatalities. And that may be counterintuitive, uh, Lucy, but um, sometimes people are taking uh, advantage of their new freedom and uh, driving, let's say, faster than they should. We're trying to be strict on that as well. And when we talk about uh, testing, you have said that you'd like Connecticut to be at a place where it's testing 42,000 per week. That's the goal. But how much of a stretch is that to get there by next Wednesday, Governor? Well, you... um, you can ask Dr. Lee. I can tell you that we are um, ramping, ramping up in a big way in terms of all the key ingredients we need, working closely with our labs, including Jackson Labs, to make sure that we have uh, the capacity there. And, Lucy, the thing that maybe worries me a little more right now is that we have a lot of capacity that's not being used. We have a, a, a fair number of our folks that can easily go get tested at the uh, drive through Abbott Lab or um, – our mobile testing that goes in North Hartford or wherever, and people don't necessarily feel comfortable wanting to get tested. And I, I really think it is a, um, a civic duty. It's for your own safety and the safety of your community to get that testing. So the limits are, um, A, sort of the supply chain, which I think we're getting a hold of, but also just uh, continuing to encourage people to uh, get tested. When you mentioned some mobile units that are out there, but what could the governor, what could you as governor and the state do better in terms of taking the testing where people live? We talked to a Stanford Mayor Martin just the other week about how they're being very proactive going to apartment complexes where people or people may not even know they're sick. They may be asymptomatic and they're testing them to figure out where there's infection and how to contain it. So what can the state do better, Governor? Um follow the lead of uh, Mayor David Martin. We've got now three mobile testing vans up from zero just a few weeks ago, and they are going to homeless shelters. Uh, They are going to um, federally qualified health centers in underserved communities, making sure that the, um, you know, testing collection anyway, we take it to you, make it easier for you to do, urge you to do it. We're ramping up uh, testing big time for all of our um, frontline responders, including everybody in the nursing homes, including patients in the nursing homes. You know, just like mass, I'd say our testing capacity is uh, finally meeting demand. Uh, when you Probably talk about... It right now. Uh, Governor Lamont, when we talk about uh, that there's overcapacity for testing, but not enough people are getting tested, so what is the number uh, by, you know, weekly? What's the latest that we know of how many people are getting tested in our state? I think you'll see in our uh, daily numbers, uh, we're averaging about um, uh, 4,000 uh, a day. Uh, maybe we did a little more uh, the last couple of days. So um, we're, we're ramping up the testing. And to me, uh, Lucy, and, and um, ask Dr. Lee this as well, almost as important as the testing is getting a quick turnaround in the response. Uh, obviously, the um, Abbott Lab test gives you a, a you know, real-time response. But even um, we're working now with labs, uh, local labs, for a quick response. Um, you know, remember six weeks ago, we'd have to go across the country to California or down to Atlanta, and that response would sometimes take uh, four, five, six days. Well, if you tested somebody positive at a nursing home, five days to get that response is an eternity. By then, many more people could be infected. I think we're doing much better on that count now. Uh, you mentioned, uh, again, quick turnaround with tests. Uh, what about, uh, we've been hearing about saliva tests that are now uh, coming online. Is that something that the state uh, could make more widespread? Uh, I sure hope so. Um, uh, I, the FDA has approved uh, the saliva test coming out of uh, Rutgers University. And uh, I know we've got a, a couple of um, companies here that have the saliva test being tested for sure, Um 
being evaluated for sure at Yale New Haven. It's obviously a much easier test to administer, easier to self-administer. And I think once you get to more broad-based regular testing, the saliva test uh, will be key. But again, as Dr. Lee, what I know I learned from him. <laughs> you keep mentioning Dr. Lee. That's Dr. Charles Lee of Jackson Laboratory. He'll be on in a little bit to talk about um, how that institute is working on research, also working on helping the uh, state of Connecticut uh, test more individuals. But you can join our conversation here on Where We Live with the Governor, 888-720-9677. Chris is calling from Waterford. Chris, go ahead. Governor, I think you've done a tremendous job in handling this pandemic, and from the constituents of Connecticut, I just want to thank you with regard to your handling of the situation. Uh, To my question, though, with regard to some of the casinos, we understand and we look at some of the patrons that do attend. We understand that they're older, and a lot of times they do have health problems. Just with regard to the casinos, are there going to be additional precautionary steps to preclude individuals or patrons from coming in or steps to further prevent or uh, prevent this pandemic or from coming out of hand or uh, uh, becoming worse. Mm. Well, thank you for your, thank for your call. You for that question. Um, I, I'm talking to all of our governors in the region regarding the um, casinos. Um, you know, uh, it's it's a real economic blow to them. Yet they're also a type of venue where you track people. You track people from the region. You track people from out of state. Charles points out they tend to be older people. You know, indoor dining is sort of part of parcel of the package. So there are a lot of reasons why I'm hesitant to open up. Um, You know, as as he points out, you can um, have every third slot or every other slot shut down. You can make sure you have cleaning on a um, hourly basis, but you still have a bunch of people in a um, in a in a big venue there, um, which I think is risky right now. Let's talk more about. Governor Lamont, let's talk more about, again, May 20th is next week. Uh, Certain non-essential businesses are able to open if they want. That includes restaurants, hair salons, some retail, some offices, also outdoor museums and zoos. How did you come to uh, this this list? Because uh, we're hearing from uh, a lot of people who work in salons. Uh, They don't want to be reopening. They worry about social distancing in a salon uh, and also worried about having the proper PPE or supplies. So can you walk us through uh, this list and what you expect to see happen next Wednesday? I expect um, stores to uh, be allowed to open, but many of them deciding not to open right now. I think I expect to see consumers allowed to go back into that salon, as you point out, or that Main Street store, but being very hesitant. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon the proprietors there to make sure they are really strict about the um, uh, social discipline, really strict about the mass. We're, if they can't get the mass, we're going to be able to provide the uh, surgical mass necessary to make sure people are protected. Because this is um, a, a balance. Um, it's not simply a ma- It's not like the end of prohibition, Lucy, and you open the doors and everybody runs out to the speakeasy. Uh, thank God that won't be the case. I think that um, we're going to take baby steps here as people cautiously go back. And and when I say people, that means proprietors, employees, as well as customers. Mm-hmm. When we talk about uh, May 20th, again, uh, you mentioned this is a baby step. But people will be able to choose if they're able to reopen and to do it safely. Uh, but we're also hearing from uh, lots of residents who worry, Governor, as we just discussed, that testing is not up to a certain level. Uh, contact tracing, the state has to rely on a lot of volunteers. And again, it's voluntary. If someone is sick, they get contacted. Then they have to provide a list of people they may be around. Are you worried that May 20th may be too soon? Uh, Too soon to give people the opportunity to open on a selective basis when they feel ready? No, I think we have um, worked closely with the scientific community, worked closely with the um, small businesses. They've helped come up with some very strict protocols that um, they need need to do to give their employees and and customers uh, some confidence there. the track and trace, you're right. We are, um, at this point, working with volunteers. The good news is we have had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers uh, come forward, you know, starting in the greater New Haven area, where they've had a couple hundred volunteers coming out of um, the School of Public Health who have been doing this for uh, you know a couple of weeks now, anyway. So uh, are we going to be ramping up over a period of time? No, it's not like a light switch where you turn it on. 
But I think we're really making good progress here to give people confidence that they slowly can get back to a new normal. Let's take some calls now from listeners. Again, 888-720-9677 if you have a question for Governor Ned Lamont. Sierra's calling in. Sierra, go ahead. Hi, how are you today? I'm, I'm doing well. Quickly ask your question. We're running out of time. Oh, sure. So I want to know why you think it's safe to open hair salons when you're saying that we have to stand six feet away, social distance, when we're literally in people's faces all day. It's not safe. And I feel like you guys are putting our lives at risk. I feel like if every other state is opening a phase two and three, why can't we? Well, as you know, uh, Rhode Island is opening uh, next week when it comes to uh, barber shops and hair salons. Um, I think we made, we had to make a judgment, and our judgment was um, by appointment only. Uh, everybody uh, wearing the mask. Uh, you're not necessarily facing the person. Only at half capacity, so if people don't feel comfortable going there to work, they can take a furlough and, uh, because. Uh, these are not going to be very busy, I don't think, initially. And if they are, we'll have to take a second look at it. So I think those were sort of reasons we thought these were baby steps we wanted to take, including the salons. Neva's calling in from Cromwell. Neva, you're on the show. Hi. Um, yeah, I wanted to find out um, when can we get tested again, even if we don't have, um, uh, you know, regular symptoms, because I, I feel like I've been in contact with some people, but I don't know when and where and how I can get that tested. Well, you can um, go to any of your uh, local testing sites, mainly at the hospitals, or um, or drive on down to um, New Haven and um, sign up at the CVS online site, and they can get you a test, and you'll get the results within 10 minutes. And again, uh, you have already signed an executive order that people don't need to have a governor or a physician's uh, permission, rather, uh, to get a test. So they can call a hospital and find out when they can go, or maybe if there's a local CVS. You mentioned New Haven, Governor. Uh, that's right. That's um, the Abbott Labs or drive-through test. But uh, we have, we, yes, we wanted to make it easier. There's no cost, no insurance cost, no copay. Get the test. Get the treatment. I want people to feel confident that whatever their, um, you know, status, even their legal status, go get tested. It's uh, the right thing to do, and uh, we're all in this together. Richard's calling in from Wallingford. Richard, what's your question? Governor, um, I want to compliment you also on your handling of this uh, crisis. I think you've done a great job. Um, my question is this. Um, for people who believe they might have had this, um, as the state starts to reopen, um, what, where does they stand on antibody testing? I can tell you uh, that um, many of our hospitals are doing the antibody testing now. Um, uh, I, I think that Dr. Lee will tell you how I think the, um, uh, the false positives were beginning to get under control right now. There was some question about the accuracy early on. The antibody testing, and I have to learn more, but it tells you, A, who has been infected, previously and who has built up the antibodies to give them some protection from the virus going forward. So I think it'll be a very important piece of our figuring out the community spread in different parts of the state. We just have a couple of minutes left with Governor Ned Lamont. Uh, Carlos is calling in from East Hartford. Uh, Carlos, quickly, what's your question? Governor, thank you very much for your work uh, for us out here in the state of Connecticut. My question is uh, one very, very personal. I own real estate, commercial real estate. I, my income on rent for the past two months have, been, have dropped 94%. I catered to schools, technical schools. I catered to bars. I catered to restaurants. I am 94% less. I don't have a loan with my bank so I can defer my monthly payments. I still have all my CAM expenses every month. And the towns are only giving me 90 days additional on my tax bill to pay. If I don't have an income and there's nothing within the programs that you have at the state or federal or SBA levels to help individuals like me, how am I going to be able to move forward? Uh, Governor Lamont, so he's uh, asking about how to relieve, uh, help landlords who aren't getting rent. 
I, I would get his contact information for us, Lucy, so I can get somebody from DECD to uh, reach out to Carlos. I can tell you that uh, we have had, I think it's uh, 30,000 small businesses, including landlords, get the um, Paycheck Protection Loans, which um, uh, covers you on um, uh, rent as well as payroll costs uh, for at least 60 days. And that what we were hoping was going to be enough to carry you in the grace period for those, uh, you know, restaurants and bars that maybe aren't making uh, the rental payments. We reached an agreement with most of the municipalities, all the municipalities, where they defer the tax payments uh, for uh, a period of time. Uh, look, I know how tough this is in all of our small business. I come out of small business. We're trying to find some way to get a bridge to getting our economy cautiously back working again including some of the tenants that uh, pay Carlos uh, the rent as needed. Mm. And Governor Annette Lamont, last question. Uh, you've put out uh, many executive orders during this pandemic. Uh, one thing that some residents want to see happen, including Secretary of the State uh, Denise Merrill, is can you put out an executive order to expand, uh, again, access to absentee ballots for that August 11th primary? Yes, I, I think we got to do that. I do not want... Um, you know, 65-year-olds waiting in line and going to a polling booth. That's uh, contrary to everything we want to do in terms of uh, slowing the spread of this virus. And I'm also thinking about November at this point as well, although that's not within my emergency powers. So we're going to try and work something. You know, the Constitution has something to say about uh, absentee ballot and who's eligible. But we're trying to work this through the legislative leadership, do something on it this week. And as far as the August primary, when could your executive order be coming out to deal with that? I'd like to thank uh, this week. All right, Governor Ned Lamont, we appreciate you calling in to where we live. Hopefully we can get you back soon and a little longer to answer more of our listener calls. Thanks, Lucy. Great talking to all of you. Hang in there. We're going to get through this. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Coming up, Connecticut has a world-renowned research institute in Farmington. How is the Jackson Laboratory contributing to the fight against COVID-19? We'll talk with the lab's scientific director, Dr. Charles Lee, right after the break. You can join us too, 888-720-9677. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We just heard from Governor Ned Lamont as he makes plans to reopen certain sectors of our state next Wednesday, May 20th. But public health officials say testing must be increased dramatically to sustain a reopening and to avoid a second wave of COVID-19. Now, the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut, is one of the organizations contributing to the state's efforts to boost testing. To tell us more, joining us now on Zoom is Dr. Charles Lee, again. And scientific director for Jackson Labs that's in Farmington, Connecticut. Uh, Charles, welcome to the show. Good morning, Lucy. How are you? I'm doing okay. I should mention you're also on the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Board. So from your meetings, I know they're meeting today to talk about education uh, reopening down the line. You know, how are you and, and others in the scientific community advising Governor Lamont on reopening? Uh, yes. So um, that, th- that, process has actually become a second job for those of us that are on the committee, uh, but something we feel very passionate about. Um, So I lead the the testing committee uh, for Reopen Connecticut uh, and provide uh, myself and the subcommittee. There's We have about eight people on our subcommittee that uh, look at the ongoing scientific evidence uh, that is coming out on uh, COVID-19 virus uh, and uh, uh, and do our best to provide the most up-to-date scientific information uh, that would help us to reopen the state in a very safe manner. Uh, when we are talking about reopening, we've had lots of conversations, uh, Dr. Charles Lee, again. Uh, we heard from uh, a, a reporter from Time Magazine last week talking about how other countries and states are looking at reopening. She talked about Hokkaido, Japan, where they saw, again, uh, numbers going down, so they chose to reopen, and then they saw a surge again. Is that something that's uh, top of mind, and how can Connecticut avoid that from happening here? Uh, absolutely. So uh, we've we've seen that kind of data coming out, not just from uh, Japan, from Germany as well, um, from Singapore. Um, so uh, understandably, there is uh, 
constant thoughts of this uh, second wave or, or the resurgence. Uh, and that's why it's really important that um, whatever we do, uh, that we take all precautions necessary to uh, make sure that uh, people keep as safe as possible. Um, and I think you would appreciate, and I think I'm sure all of your listeners would appreciate that uh, being able to do this is um, is not just based on any one thing that we can do. It's really going to have to be uh, a complement of, of many factors. Uh, so testing certainly is one very important aspect of it, to be able to make sure that uh, we test uh, everyone that needs to be tested uh, and that that testing is available to them. Uh, but uh, but certainly, um, and I think just as importantly, uh, so continuing to do social distancing, uh, continuing to use masks uh, in, in public places, uh, and and uh, many of the other recommendations that the governor have already mentioned, uh, these need to all be taken together in order to maximize the safety of our citizens. Mm. Uh, governor Lamont referenced you a few times. So tell us how Jackson Labs shifted uh, during this pandemic, to, again, to help the state with testing, and how are you able to do it in your lab? Yes, yeah, so actually the Jackson Laboratory is a nonprofit research institute. We came to Connecticut in 2013 um, um, and um, built up a presence here, adding to the critical mass of scientists that are in the genetics and genomics field. Um, and the Jackson Laboratory, uh, we've been around for 90 years. Our headquarters is in Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, and we've been, uh, we're, we're very well known for uh, making and applying mouse models uh, for studying human diseases. Uh, the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine here in Connecticut was the first foray of the Jackson Laboratory to have a, 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 an institute that uh, specifically takes that knowledge that we're building from mouse models and apply it uh, directly into uh, different fields of medicine. And so we have uh, on site over 500 uh, scientists and, and support staff uh, that are just focused on looking, applying genetics and genomics in medicine. And uh, because of that, one of, the, one of our capabilities that we built up uh, since arriving was the establishment of a diagnostic laboratory uh, on the second floor of the building. Um, and this, the reason for that is because uh, before coming to Connecticut, uh, I was uh, at the Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston uh, and faculty at Harvard Medical School. And uh, my area of research revolved a lot around the development of new uh, diagnostic assays uh, for, for human health. And one of the things I realized, it was so, so important that uh, new research, new findings that, uh, that arise, that we can quickly get that into the clinic and, and provide uh, those uh, apply those uh, new knowledge uh, to diagnostic testing. And, and in order to do that, you need a CLIA diagnostic lab. So that's why we built that here at JAX. Uh, we were using that diagnostic lab uh, primarily to uh, provide uh, cancer diagnostic uh, testing uh, uh, for patients. Uh, but then when this whole COVID-19 situation uh, began to arise and, and, and spread, uh, we requested a an audience with the governor and his staff. Uh, that I still remember it. Uh, it was on March the 10th. Uh, and the reason we had um, requested that was because we knew that uh, we needed to, there needed to be a lot more testing uh, available. We knew that this is something that the Jackson Laboratory could contribute to. Um, and uh, there was a sense of urgency that this needed to be done quickly. So we met with uh, the governor and his, uh, and his uh, staff on the 10th. Uh, they were, uh, the governor has been very, very, uh, you know, receptive and, um, and, and has been very good at uh, spearheading and staying ahead of, of this pandemic. And so right away encouraged us to work with his staff uh, to build up that capacity, which we have. Two weeks later, uh, we were testing our first patients uh, for COVID-19. And understandably, you know, with all the regulatory uh, uh, components that are involved in bringing up a new diagnostic test, which normally takes two to three months to implement, uh, it's an incredible feat uh, to be able to do that in two weeks uh, with the state's help. And, and that's basically, uh, I think, uh, just shows how the state has been working uh, very closely together with its constituents 
to make sure that, uh, you know, we're well prepared for this pandemic. Dr. Lee, so when you were up and running and the samples were coming in, I think that was March 23rd, your your lab was testing 100 to 150 samples per day. So now uh, in mid-May, how many samples are is your lab going through? Yeah, so right now we have... Um, we are running, uh, we have a capacity of about 550 tests per day. Uh, so we've ramped up uh, during that time from 100 tests per day to 550 tests per day. Um, when it gets to uh, anything over about 500 tests per day, uh, there is a, um, in order to significantly ramp up beyond that, uh, there needs to be a lot more uh, automation involved. Uh, and that's something which uh, we've already uh, a couple weeks ago have uh, has started to purchase the uh, automation necessary in order to ramp up even further. And so um, it's actually uh, quite exciting. Uh, some of that automation that we've uh, uh, purchased uh, has uh, is actually coming in uh, today and tomorrow, and we're going to be uh, implementing that in, in order to ramp up even further. Mm. Again, I'm talking with Dr. Charles Lee on Zoom today, Scientific Director for Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. Uh, We just heard uh, Dr. Lee talking about how uh, Jackson Labs is helping with uh, testing capacity. Uh, When we talk about uh, your uh, lab doing this kind of diagnostic testing, what about other facilities in Connecticut? How many others are there that can do the kind of testing you're doing? Yes, yeah, so um, we're actually so in addition to ourselves, um, we're actually working very closely uh, in the task force with um, a, a company called Semaphore. Uh, Eric Schatt is the CEO of that company, uh, so he's a member of that subcommittee. Uh, we're working with uh, investigators at Yale, including David Pieper, uh, who's at the Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, And it's also important to know that a lot of the hospitals across the the state also have COVID-19 testing capabilities as well. So, um, you know, one of the things I've been absolutely amazed by with with um, uh, this whole task force, uh, and particularly the the, the, uh, testing subcommittee, is how everyone is really uh, band together uh, and uh, offering advice to one another, sharing information, and supporting one another and getting each of the facilities up and going. Um, and so um, I, I'm actually very, very confident that the, the numbers that the governor has uh, has put forward uh, for reopening Connecticut, uh, indeed that this uh, consortium of testing cap- uh, sites are going to be able to um, not just meet, but beat that number as well to, uh, to stay ahead of this pandemic. Tell me about how Jackson Labs is partnering with, I believe, the town of West Hartford to get rapid testing to its first responders. And we have a question from a listener, uh, Betty, who wants to know about, you know, her concern is the rate of false negatives that these rapid tests are showing. Can you talk about that? Uh, Yes. So um, uh, let's talk first about the the false negatives. Um, As you can imagine, um, because of um, the, it, the significant impact of this pandemic, um, everyone is coming together in a very, very fast way to, to provide tools uh, and, and ways to combat the pandemic, including those that are, are, are generating uh, new tests and then those that are impl- people implementing it. And so um, certainly you're gonna find, uh, at, it's, it's almost, uh, it really, the analogy we use is, it's, uh, <laughs> it's like flying uh, a plane and, and still building parts of it along the way. It seems like a scary <laughs> thought, but in order to, to meet this pandemic hand, uh, you know, head on, I, I don't see any other way. We, we need to implement things quickly in the best possible manner. We've, we learn a lot of things along the way as well, and we, we make course corrections uh, accordingly. Uh, and, um, and so the false negatives certainly is one aspect where, for example, um, we found, uh, we found, for example, that um, the, some of the tests, um, uh, if they were uh, administered uh, slightly differently, uh, that um, they increased the false negatives. And so to give you an example, there was one test recently where um, instead of putting, when you take the, 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 the swab uh, that was taken from the patient, and you put it directly into the, the, the machine to do the uh, assessment of the viral content. 
Um, if you put it in directly into the machine, uh, the, this, the test works uh, according to the way it should be working. Uh, and, um, and in some cases, people were actually putting that swab into uh, something called viral transport media and then testing it just a couple minutes later. And what that resulted in is a dilution of the, the virus in, in, the, in the solution, such that when they did actually go to test it, uh, it would still pick up the virus, but in some individuals that have lower titers or lower amounts of the virus, it got diluted to a point where it was no longer detectable by, by the, uh, the machine. And so just you know, understanding that, that was, uh, that was appreciated very quickly. Uh, in, people investigated what's causing that, and then a course correction was made such that, okay, using that uh, testing parameter, we no longer should be diluting in, in transport media. We should just be using it directly into the machine. So mm-hmm. that's just one example of how, um, you know, we're, we're learning and correcting as, as we go along. I mentioned that West Hartford collaboration. We're also hearing again about saliva tests. Um, is that something that uh, more Connecticut researchers are looking at in terms of, of helping uh, avoid these kinds of false negatives? So the saliva test um, is, is a big breakthrough, uh, in my opinion, in, in the COVID-19 testing capabilities. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's going to necessarily help with the false negatives, For me, what's most important about the saliva test is that it suddenly opens up the capability of people uh, being able, well, there's two things, right? So number one, uh, it's certainly uh, much more, uh, much more, um, uh, uh, it would be better for individuals that want to be tested just to be able to spit into into a tube and send that off rather than have someone go up. Uh, deep into their nostrils in order to get uh, viral specimens. Uh, that can be a little bit discomforting for some individuals. It requires, uh, it requires uh, personnel with proper PPE. Uh, so just to collect those specimens from the traditional routes it is more problematic, takes more time, uh, and involves more resources. Uh, if we are able to bring saliva testing on board, and, and there's a lot of indications that are saying that, yes, that's going to be possible, uh, then we can, uh, it'll be easier for people to collect those specimens, uh, send them in for testing. You can imagine uh, that at some point, uh, people could be able to collect the saliva specimens at home and, and send them in rather than to have to go through drive through centers, go to the hospitals, etc. cetera. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the, the testing committee is actually, uh, I was actually exchanging emails back and forth on this weekend uh, with Yale, Semaphore, and others about sharing documentation on saliva testing so that we can get this up and going as quickly as possible in the state. You're hearing Dr. Charles Lee, again, Scientific Director for the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut, here on Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. After the break, we're going to continue our conversation, learn more about how this research institution has shifted in the pandemic and how they're helping researchers around the world. You can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today on Zoom, Dr. Charles Lee, Scientific Director of the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. Uh, Charles, we heard you talk about mouse models. Before we get to that, could you give us a little bit more on the nuts and bolts of how this COVID-19 test is working exactly in terms of what, uh, again, um, they're looking in, into when we take a test in terms of the RNA and what researchers can glean from that? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, so I think the first thing with regard to this test is it's important to understand there's actually two components for the test, right? There's the, there's the collection component where the, the, the patient, the individual, uh, either spits or, or does a swab where we get the materials from the, the, uh, the individual. And then there's the actual diagnostic testing component, which is what you're referring to. So the, the, this virus is, is a fascinating virus. It's, um, it is, uh, in order for it to uh, infect, what it does is the virus itself contains a single strand of RNA molecule. Um, now, the scientific dogma, uh, what we call the central dogma in genetics, is that 
in, in human beings and most organisms, basically you have your DNA. The DNA is, is uh, copied into something called RNA. And then the RNA is then uh, translated into proteins. Uh, and the proteins are, are, are sort of make what make the living cells function. Uh, this virus is just a single-stranded RNA. So in, and, and it's believed that the reason uh, why, uh, you know, it's in this case is it evolutionarily helps this virus to actually uh, skip that one step to make the proteins it needs even faster. And so, uh, so basically what happens is the virus uh, attaches to uh, a receptor on our cells called the ACE2 receptor. It enters into our cells, the RNA is, sent, is extruded into our cells, and then the proteins necessary for building new viruses is, is uh, created in our cells, and then our cells burst open, and, and a lot of these new viruses then come out to infect uh, neighboring cells. So for this particular test, what we're actually doing is we're looking at specific DNA sequences that are conserved uh, in that RNA virus. Uh, and depending on the test that you're using, sometimes one a test will target one or two of these regions, others will target three of these regions. Um, and if you, uh, when you actually take a sample from a patient and essentially you lyse everything or you burst open everything, all the cells and virus particles, bacteria particles that is in that sample. And then what we're looking for is we have a, something called a PCR assay that will specifically look for those conserved sequences in the virus. If we see it, uh, then what will happen is a fluorescence, uh, a, a fluorescence uh, signal will increase in those samples. And that sample will can, that fluorescence uh, signal can be detected uh, by the PCR machine. So if you have virus particles in your specimen, uh, you'll get a fluorescence uh, uh, signal that increases. And if you don't, you won't get mm -hmm. that fluorescence signal. And that's what helps us determine whether or not a person is, uh, has uh, COVID-19 virus particles uh, coming from in their body or not. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, Jackson Labs, again, is known for creating mouse models that are used for researching diseases. So tell us more about the mouse model and during this pandemic, how Jackson Labs is helping researchers, again, with a particular mouse model uh, to use uh, to learn about treatments and others against COVID-19. Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier in the program, uh, the Jackson Laboratory is a nonprofit research institute that's been around for over 90 years and, and really sort of grounded in our experience, long, long experience in developing mouse models for human diseases. And so one of the mouse models that, uh, that we have is uh, a mouse model where uh, the ACE2 receptor, which I just talked to you about, that's critical for the, the, the COVID-19 virus to get into our cells. So that ACE2 receptor is encoded in our, in our genes. Uh, what we've done is we've taken that, uh, the human ACE2 receptor and inserted it into the mouse genome um, and that, uh, and produced, uh, we, we're producing mice that actually have the human ACE2 receptor. Now, why is that important? So certainly uh, as one example, people that are uh, developing new vaccines uh, for COVID-19, um, what they want to be able to do is to test in a model, uh, what, you know, in, in, in some sort of model, uh, whether or not uh, when you infect uh, COVID-19 to that model, uh, will the vaccine protect or not protect against it? And so um, it's very difficult to get tip regular mice to be infected by COVID-19. But, uh, but this special mouse uh, that we have, uh, because we've inserted the human uh, ACE2 receptor in it, uh, it is capable of being infected. So you can imagine somebody with a new vaccine, they will have, let's say, 5, 10 mice that they quote unquote vaccinate and 5, 10 mice that they don't vaccinate, infect all of them with the, the COVID-19 virus. And hopefully we'll see that those that had the vaccination uh, won't get sick and and, and, and compared to those that, that didn't get the vaccination. So that's, in, the, that's incredibly important for us to get real hard data on uh, in, in live organisms, uh, whether or not a particular vaccine is working.
Uh, we know that uh, the world has changed so much during this pandemic, Dr. Charles Lee. Can you talk about uh, the impact on the scientific community uh, with uh, research labs closed or working at reduced capacity and how Jack's Labs, again, is helping uh, with this particular research, even including um, trying to conserve these particular mouse models? So... You know, I have to say, not just at the Jackson Laboratory, but all throughout the country, um, I've been so impressed at uh, the scientists' response uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. You uh, certainly uh, not being able to do active research uh, in the lab, being able to come into work uh, to do that um, it, it is, uh, is uh, slows down the progress of science. Uh, having said that, what I've seen uh, here at Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine, uh, and as well as I'm sure other institutions, what I've seen is a massive focus of people's energies uh, into uh, looking at how to combat scientific research on how to combat COVID-19. So um, uh, people that are immunologists, people that are microbiologists, people that are geneticists, people that um, you know look at co systems biology from a computational angle, and, and more. All these scientists are using their individual experiences, uh, working with others to you know, to find ways to uh, innovative ways to uh, mm -hmm. understand more about the virus uh, and combat it. Uh, here at J at the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, they set the, our investigators set up a Slack channel. It's like a um, it's like a chat room that's on 24 hours, where <laughs> in, people will read papers, the latest paper, and they'll share it with others and and throw out some insights. And others will debate it, and then they'll start to see if they can move that forward. Uh, it's it's really been exciting to see. And, and you know, among academics, uh, I'll tell you, among academics generally, people have uh, academics. We could, uh, tend to be a little bit more conservative, meaning, you know, they, they, um, everyone wants to get ahead and, and publish their mm -hmm. papers first, et cetera. And so uh, there's a lot of competition. But in this uh, new era, especially with COVID-19, there's been so much more openness uh, with the scientific information uh, that that's uh, really, I thought, I think has brought out the, the best of uh, humanity among all the scientists uh, and, and that's great. That's great to see. I love to hear that scientists are using Slack uh, to read each other's uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I we, mean, you, you do whatever you, works, right? Well, we really appreciate the time you've given us today, Dr. Charles Lee. We hope to have you back soon, maybe to talk more about how Jackson Labs is, is really uh, contributing and helping with STEM education and helping educate a future a scientist. We hope to have you back soon. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Again, Dr. Charles Lee is the scientific director for the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. Uh, today's show was produced by Carmen Baskoff. Thanks to Tess Terrible on the phones today. Our tech producer is Kat Pastor. We're going to be back with a live episode on Thursday looking at the state's plans on reopening colleges and universities. We hope you call in then. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening. <laughs>